We're so excited that Brother AJ can be here. I already mentioned it last night, but I'm going to mention it again. I highly recommend Mikra, his podcast. If you want to look, it's on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, um, all over the place. But uh, M-I-Q-R-A. And um, it's an amazing podcast. Anything you want to say about that real quick? <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> I'll say it for him. It's incredible. Um, so it's got three seasons, and um, well, they're on the third season, right? Yep. They're on their third season, and it's just a wealth of knowledge, very good information, and it will really help you. You have a book coming out. Yep. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, we have uh, season one of our podcast. Um, the co-host that does it with me, he turned it into a book. It's going to be a devotional style, so if y'all... Uh, follow us on social media. Um, Levi, the guy who I work with, he does all that. But if you go look it up, it's Micra Bible Study. You can stay up to date with when that book will come out. So be on the lookout for that. Amazing. <clears throat> what I felt to do to start this off, and I do want to get to your questions. I hope we'll have time to get to them. But I really felt to ask Brother AJ to first kick this off talking about uh, the paradigm shift of righteousness. I feel like it really is in line with the things we were just talking about, what Brother Ian preached, what Brother Reaver preached, what I just preached about mercy and truth. I would love for him. How many of you have ever heard the word righteousness before? How many of you feel like you really understand what that word means? Raise your hand high. Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, a few of us understand it to a degree, but I would love for him to just kind of touch on what it truly means and the motive. I guess if you could get into the motive of righteousness, when you were talking about it on the podcast, it really spoke to me about why we do what we do and how righteousness, what it really looks like in the 21st century for an apostolic campus minister. Um, if you can hit on that, AJ, for the beginning. Sure. I'm um, going to give a little history and the biblical definition of that word. What we've normally thought that word meant is doing right. And if that's what you think the word means, that's actually correct, but we need to define what right is. Because if I go through this room and ask each of you what the right thing is, we're gonna get probably 25 different responses. If you ask the traditional apostolic, they're gonna say, you know, wearing a long skirt, not cutting my hair, they're gonna give all those responses, that's what's doing right. And we're, we're wrong <laughs> uh, on that. The word righteousness has a direction of what is right. And it is doing right for someone else who is incapable of doing for themselves. That's what the actual word means. Wow. So if you were to travel to Israel today and you were to walk down the streets of, you know, Tel Aviv and they had on the side of the road, they had uh, homeless people begging. You will hear them saying these words, Anisadik, Anisadik, Anisadik. They're saying in Hebrew, someone be righteous, someone be righteous. Because that word, um, righteous in Hebrew, it's tzedakah. And when you call someone a tzedek, you're calling them a righteous person. Because in their culture, that word means someone do for me what I can't do for myself. That's what it means. And it's a very fundamental doctrine in, um, in the Bible. The first time we really start seeing the, the buildup of the word righteous is when Abraham was waiting in his tent in the hottest part of the day looking for someone to serve. And unbeknownst to him, God himself and two angels walked up, and he didn't know, but he brought them into his house, and he washed their hands, washed their feet, and gave them a meal. And that's the history. That's where it all started. This is called the Igla Rufa in Hebrew. So if someone comes to your house, what you do is you prepare them a meal, you give them food for their journey. They, they are to be taken care of by you. You are hospitable. So let me ask this question. If when you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, what is the most terrible sin you see in Sodom and Gomorrah? No, don't be that quiet, y'all. Don't be awkward. Y'all are y'all are adults now. You're you're not in youth group anymore. Awkward's no longer in your life. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Well, we don't know because it doesn't give us any of the backstory of Sodom and Gomorrah. Most often when I ask people, they always say sodomy, heinous sexual sin. If you ask 
uh, anyone from the East, anyone, India, Asia, if they read that story, they'll say they were unhospitable to their guest. That's the number one sin that someone from the East picks up when they read that story. And so we start developing this theme that God really wants us to be righteous. So now let's fast forward, and I wish I'd go listen to the podcast, I'll break that down. But when we get to Jesus, we see him sitting with sinners, and we see that it bothers the religious people, and they say, why does your rabbi sit with teachers, or sit with sinners? And he said, because the well have no need of a physician. I'm here to do for others what they can't do for themselves. Now, I know we quote the scripture a lot, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and shall men given to your bosom. And we always talk about that in the term of finances. But listen to what Jesus said. He said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Now, let me paint the picture for you. So what they would do is when they wanted to buy grain at the temple, they would come and they had the scales that weighed left and right, you know, the, the scales. And so they would put a weight over here that was measured to a shekel, which is like their dollar. And so they would have a shekel over here, and they would put grain on there. And when it leveled out, they owed a shekel for that amount of grain. A righteous man would tilt it into their favor and give them more. They would give them more grain than what they had to pay for. Wow. He was tilting the scales into their favor. And Jesus said, give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I'm going to slam the scales in your favor. Wow. And they're like, what are you talking about, Jesus? He says, whatever forgiveness you withhold, this is the rest of the parable, it'll be withheld from you. Whatever forgiveness you give, I'll give that back to you. So in Jesus' mind, it's not about money. It's not about grain. It's about love and forgiveness. Mm. And so look at what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus would have been fully righteous and just in wiping us off the planet. And yet he looked at us and slammed the scales into our favor. Mm -hmm. And he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. He was doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, which was remove our sins. And so that's where John, his, uh, his disciple, says these words. My little children, I write these things unto you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So when you go forward and you show righteousness, not the length of your sleeve, not the amount of days you fasted, not the days in prayer you spent time in, but actually go and serve people that can't do for themselves, I'm talking just practical because that was part of what you asked for. Seeing somebody in a wheelchair and just coming up behind them and not treating them like a cripple, treating them like a fellow citizen. Actually just having a conversation with them like they're a literal human. Yeah. And not treating them like you're doing them some kind of favor, but just actually spending time with them like they're not a freak. That's good. Not pandering them. Yeah. But actually spending time with them because you're treating them like it's just you're a normal person just in a wheelchair. Yeah. And that can be extrapolate that across any any socioeconomic status of anybody, no matter who they are, giving them dignity that they are human beings. When you do that, you're giving them something. You'd be surprised how many God conversations can happen by just giving somebody dignity. So good. Just bare bones, dignity. And so giving people who are not able to give themselves anything, that's how people are going to know we're his disciples. And here's, I want to say this. There's one thing of just having knowledge to do it, and it becomes a tactic. This isn't tactics on, okay, I'm going to, I've got one, two, three to get them into my church. Forget yeah. that garbage. Yeah. You're the church. Go to them without a tactic. You know how devastating it is for somebody to find out the only reason you had a conversation with them was so that you can invite them to your church, so that you can get a gift card for the Christmas, whoever invites the most guests. Thing. Salesman. You're a, you're a pyramid schemer is what you are. You're not a disciple. That's exactly what you are, and it's gross. Do this. Pray this enough to where it becomes a part of your DNA that where you're looking at somebody and they're actually concerned. And here's what God will call you. He'll call you a righteous man or woman. And that's the greatest compliment you'll ever receive.
That's so good. I'm going to say this story really quick, but I was in college at the University of Maryland. There was a young man who was in my class, and I tried to tell him about Jesus uh, early on in the class. He would not listen. He was just like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, he was totally like, no thanks. And um, we went to go get lunch together. I said, why don't we go get lunch? We wanted to get lunch. And I was standing in line about to have lunch with him, and the Lord spoke to me. I heard the voice of God, spoke to my spirit and said, pay for his lunch. I said, okay. I paid for his lunch. We sat down. He said, thank you so much. And you know what he said to me? What was that about your campus ministry? I lie not, true story. He came and got the Holy Ghost two weeks later. If I didn't buy his lunch, I'm convinced he never would ask me that question. But because in that moment, God wanted me to be righteous, to do something, to reach for him. I was just obeying God. I didn't know where I was going to go. It opened him up, and we had a conversation. He came, and God filled him with the Spirit. There's something that happens when you do that. And I'm going to just touch on one other thing. When he was talking about, we don't make this just about numbers and reach for people and say, come to my... Here's, guys, here's the problem. I've been there. I'm being honest. I, I was there, especially early on in campus ministry. The Lord convicted the mess out of me for this. It was all about how many people got the Holy Ghost. How many people got baptized. Here's the problem. When you're doing that, it's about you. It's not about the soul. Yeah. It's about your social media posts. It's yeah. not about the soul. And if we operate like that, people, as I said, the power of God will draw people. But the love of God is going to be what keeps people. Yeah. And if they think they're just another number, and they think that the only reason that they're in your church or your campus ministry is because you want to show off to the pastor <clears throat> or to the district or to this or that, they're not going to feel love. They're going to feel quite the opposite. And they probably won't stick around. So please make your motive. Get your motive purified. Who cares how many people show up? What matters is quality, not quantity. Yeah. Are people being changed? Are people hearing the gospel? You sow. Some water, some sow. But God gives the increase. We go crazy about the increase. And we, we shout about the increase. And you should shout about the increase. But when you make the increase your focus to talk about and not the sowing and the watering, you're, you're blasting God's job when you really need to be focusing on your job, which is sowing and watering. God gives the increase. I was going to ask you another question unless you want to touch on that. I'll, I'll add just one brief thing and then we can move on. Don't, don't borrow the pressure on yourself that you have to get every person from zero, which is an atheist, to a 10, a preacher of the gospel. You need to just get in their life and discern where they are and just know maybe I'm here to get them from a zero to a two. If I can just get them to believing in God. But what you do is you now you beat yourself up, you have anxiety, and then when you feel like you're terrible at this, you don't want to do it anymore and you evade it and you quit campus ministry. But just just know, like I ran into somebody and for all I know, this person was going to commit suicide today and my handshake prevented it. But because you didn't get them in a baptismal pool, you're just like, oh, man, I blew it. Just discern where people are at. You might, when somebody comes along, they may have ran into 20 of us before they got to you. And you got them from a, an 8 to a 9 and got them baptized filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't give yourself so much pressure. Like, we take it on ourselves. I've got to get them from 0 to 10. And there will be people in your life you do that with. There will be. But... You, we, we kind of take it on ourselves. We've got to do it with everybody we come in contact with. And we're killing ourselves with pressure. That is so powerful. That's why the Bible says we are one body in many parts. And some, some of you are very gifted at evangelizing. And others of you are very gifted at discipling. You need to understand. And I'm not saying that if you're gifted at one, you don't do the other. You do both. Because you've got to learn. right? You've got to be stretched. But... Uh, you also need to know where you're strong. And sometimes we all think because we're in campus ministry, we're all supposed to be, you know, superstar evangelists. Right. But here's the problem. If everybody wants to be an evangelist and everybody's bringing people in and nobody's teaching them and nobody's discipling them and no one's keeping them, they're going out the back door as quick as they came in the front. <clears throat> we need people to step up into other giftings and to be those things. And uh, that is when you begin to see the body operating together. And Paul said to, I believe it was Corinth, he's like, I'm glad I didn't baptize you. Because yeah. if I would have, you'd idolize me. Mm -hmm. 
I'm glad it was someone else. And this is where his dissertation of super apostles. And it was Paul didn't borrow that pressure. So don't kill yourself with, with that. But be intentional about where is this person at and where can I get them? And let that be enough for today. Amen? Amen. That's amazing. Uh, the next question I wanted to ask you, AJ, is uh, we talked about, just talked about righteousness, and that is, as you understand, doing for others what they can't do for themselves, standing in the gap, you know, I look for a man to stand in the gap. That was what I was talking about. But in light of righteousness, if you could just touch on the image of God, I know this is a huge subject, but if you could kind of segue into how these campus ministers can be the image and not and also not worship. And I know you talked about it a little bit last night, you know, not becoming Babylon, sitting at the table, not eating the meat. But if you can talk about the image of God for this group on the campus, what that looks like and how to become the image of God, if you could talk about that and where that came from. Yeah, let's do three scriptures here. Genesis 1, where it says, let us make man in our image. The preposition there, in, is a very important preposition that we often overlook. And when often we read that, we're like, okay, well, we look like God. He's some kind of human form. God's not a human. He's a holy. That's, he's a, that's real. No, I'm not even joking. That's, yeah. that's his being. Right. He is described as something ethereal. He's not an animal. He's not a human. It calls him with an article, a holy. He's, some, he's the only one out there like it. There's no other holy like him. He's the only holy being that exists. So when he made us in his image, it's not this, this physical body. This was from the creative genius of a holy God, this all right here. And this is unique because he designed it. But what that preposition is alluding to is imaging him. I'll give you an example. In English, you can use the preposition in in three ways. There's water in this cup. Um, I wrote a letter in ink. This, when I used it this way, the preposition is denoting the location in the cup. In ink, a letter in ink, the preposition is denoting the type that the letter was written in. In pencil, it would denote a different type. But what if I told you I work in ministry? That's neither location nor type. It's function. Hmm. Ministering is what I do. It's not what I am. It's what I do. I am a human who ministers. I work in medicine. I work in law. That's, good. That's a functional preposition. That, and I won't get into the nerdy Hebrew grammar, but in Genesis, it's a functional preposition. So turn the noun image into a verb. Your imagers. So God's will was that we would sit in the garden, learn what he was like, and then go and show that. Wherever you are, it should be as if God were there because you're imaging him. But we've misinterpreted that, and so we want to look like a holy. You're not holy. You're not. You're a human. What's inside of you is holy, and it's still not you. It's him. And he inhabits us so that we can learn from him and sit with him. And then go and act like him. So second scripture. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Now, traditionally we have taught that that means don't use his name in some defamatory way. And that's still a great idea. Don't do that. But that's not what the, pre the, the actual text means. The word vain means don't put him to a lie. The Hebrew words uh, sav is don't put him to a lie. Meaning... Whatever he has shown us, if you don't go and show that, you've made him a liar. Wow. So if you're going to carry his name, you better do it. I had a, one of my Semitics professor, he looked at me one day and he said, don't even say hallelujah unless you intend to praise him. Wow. Wow. He said, because if you don't, you just made him a liar. So if God is love and you don't show that, you've made him a liar. If God is righteous and you didn't show that, you made him a liar. The third scripture, and Jesus was really intentional about this. When they asked him, teach us how to pray. And he said, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
It's the New Testament Shema prayer. Hallowed be thy name means my name is sacred and hallowed. Okay, so I won't use it in a curse word. He's like, yes, don't do that. But I'm talking about something more than that. I'm about to put my name on you as representatives of me. And if you don't make my name hallowed by being out there as a jerk, you've made me a liar. So this whole idea of imaging him is, now let's look at another Hebrew word, um, iniquity. The word iniquity is avon. In Hebrew, it means twisted or bent. It means distorted. When we sin, sin is not a list of don'ts, first of all. Sin literally in Hebrew means miss the mark. So what's your aim? See, that's, again, if I ask you questions, we'll come up with a bunch of different definitions. The Bible gives us our aim. Image me. And if you don't, you've missed. That's why you always say sin, transgression, and iniquity. The word transgression means to break covenant. If you've missed the mark, you've broken the covenant, and now you're distorted. You're not my image. You're a, a circus mirror. You're a, a house of mirrors version of me. Kind of looks like me, and we look through a glass darkly, but it's not quite right. And year by year, sanctification by sanctification, we're polishing the mirror till we look like him. That's what Paul was talking about. So you need to be very honest with yourself when your attitude comes out, when your prejudice comes out, when your anger comes out. You, there's nothing wrong with your emotions. That's not sin. When those things come out, they're lights on the dashboard of your soul saying, hey, there's a problem in the engine. You need to check this. Yeah. Those are great. You've got to be thankful you have feelings. Yeah, when they come up, you look at it and say, that's bent. That's twisted. That's not image. And then submit that to God and say, I'm feeling this, but I'm going to act this way. So practical. Um, Heath Ledger, he was a method actor. Method acting is when you don't just perform the, the character on stage. You become it outside of the stage. So Heath Ledger got into the character of the Joker. He got so deep into the character that his family said he was a very jovial, happy-go-lucky, funny guy, just not a care in the world. He got so deep into the character of the Joker, he, get, he went through clinical depression and ended up committing suicide. He method acted that. On the other side, Jim Caviezel played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. He converted to Christianity. Wow. He was method acting Jesus, and he started seeing some stuff, and he was like, there's something to this. So what you're supposed to do, the word uh, transform, and it says be therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind, that's the Greek word metamorphosis. It doesn't happen the second you got filled with the Holy Ghost. It's a day-by-day -day process. And the world, if I were the devil, I would lie to your generation and say, be true to yourself. That's, so good. That's what I would tell you, to keep you from ever imaging Christ. Because when you feel a certain way, you have to be true to that. Let's play that out. If Jesus would have been true to himself, he would have never went to the cross because he didn't feel like going. That's right. It's, this is possible. Can this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So your job is every day to identify the twisted, broken, bent parts of you and go and still act like Christ, even though you don't feel like it, until you turn into that character. You know how you do it? Final thing and we'll move on. The Lord gave us his prayer. How many of you ever prayed the tabernacle? I'm going to challenge it right now. The tabernacle is for a sinner to come to God. You come to the altar, labor of water, all those steps, you get to the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat. Listen to the Lord's prayer and see if you can figure it out. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day, or thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Do you hear it? That's the tabernacle starting with the Holy of Holies. It's the tabernacle backwards. Wow. For born again sons and daughters in the kingdom, you have more relationship with an altar than you do the Father, though. Every time you mess up, you run back to an altar and you leave him. He's the one who cleans you now. You start with the Father. So every day, 
That prayer is not just this little prayer that I check off of a list. It's for me, not God. I'm reminding myself every day, three times a day, I'm reminding myself, I have a father in heaven, so therefore I'm adopted as a son. I'm going to represent him and hallow his name everywhere that I am. I want his kingdom to come in the Holloway home as it is in heaven. And if it starts there, it'll be an outgrowth. If I can treat my kids with respect and dignity, even though they're weaker than me, I can replicate that everywhere else because I'm acting out that character. God, I have been given bread. Who around me doesn't have bread? Who can I be righteous to? Give us, not me, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. If you do that, every time somebody's mad at you, it's habit now. You just remembered your, your liturgy. Forgive them. Jesus didn't just have that prayer. Jesus lived it. Forgive us our sins and we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not to the test, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus in the garden, he literally was there and he said, is it possible? No, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. He's living the prayer. He's playing out the image of the invisible God and he's become, he is it. He comes out and looks at the Sabbath and says, could you not watch and pray with me? Pray that you don't enter the test. That's part of the Lord's prayer. Pray that you don't enter into temptation, but deliver us. Could you not pray with me that I wouldn't be delivered over to evil? On the cross, forgive them. He had repeated it so much that he was it. That's the practical. But we just kind of like breeze through this haphazardly, never being intentional about this. I, am, I don't want to be apostolic. I want to be a Christian. Apostolic just means a sent one. I'm going. That's that's established. That's already said. I'm here this weekend. That means I was sent. Yeah. But when I got here, I wanted to show you Christ. When you get there, see, everybody wants to be apostolic. And what happens is when you get there, you don't know what to do. Be sent. That's what apostolic means. But then when you get there, now it's time to act the character of Christ that you've been practicing on and off the set. You're good at it in church. How about at Walmart? Right. Yeah. Very good. And here's the test. The second you start praying this, I'm telling you right now, you're going to come across the rudest people in your life. <laughs> because God wants to see if you're going to play that character. That's what it means to image him, though. My, my, my. So what are we going to do on our campus? We're going to image him. It's called Christians. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, let, me, let me say that. In the book of Acts, it's Acts 11, there was a group of Gentiles that had never heard this gospel, and they, we go preaching to them, thankfully. And Peter preaches to the Gentiles, and the elders got mad at him, and they said, what are you doing preaching to these uncircumcised? And thankfully, Peter didn't look at the elders and say, forget you, you don't, you don't want a part of this end time revival. He went to them and submitted and said, I had a vision, and this is the vision of the, the sheep being let down, so I went to preach for them, and the Holy Ghost fell on them as it did us in the beginning. Thankfully, those elders were so sensitive, they said, even to the Gentiles then. Well, they sent a man named Barnabas to that city. Barnabas is Hebrew for son of encouragement. That's the perfect guy for the job. He goes to the Gentiles, and the Bible said, literally, he encouraged them. He's encouraging the Gentiles. And they started teaching, we have this in history books, they started teaching these Gentiles about a man named Jesus, the Christ. He, they talked to him about foot washing and loving people and giving to the poor and breaking bread and dividing it and all this stuff. And so when Paul showed up to that city, the Bible said, and it was there that we were first called Christians. They looked at Paul and they said, are you the Christ? And Paul was like, no, 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 I'm not the Christ. And he's like, well, you're acting just like the guy that they've been telling us about. Wow. wow. That's so good. <laughs> and there we were first called Christians. It's one thing to talk about Christ. It's a whole other thing to show him. Please go do that. We need that so desperately. Because if you haven't watched YouTube lately, we're getting eviscerated on YouTube by all these channels. And the number one thing they're saying about us is we're jerks. Wow. And they're not wrong. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. But we're too arrogant to humble ourselves because we have the truth. Well, we know Jesus' name, baptism. Yeah, so did the people in Jesus' parable. He said, did I not cast out devils in your name? Did I not perform miracles in your name? Did I not prophesy? Those are people of the name. Yeah. Wow. 
part for me, I didn't know you. So please get this part right. I, I'm being as aggressive as I can on this because Good. I have faith in us. Yeah. If I didn't, I would, I would have already left. Yeah. I'll go preach to someone else, but I believe in this. Yeah. Because you're looking at a man who saw Christians when my three-year-old son died. And the church, I had a man in the church took a vacation day, Brother McGurk, sat in my living room and said, I'm just here to sit with you and weep. I said, bro, I said, why would you take a vacation day to sit with me? And he was like, because that's what the church does. I have seen the church and what we're capable of. And I am a product. I'm a recipient of it. So I am bound. I can be nothing else but this. Because if I don't be like Christ, I will, I will kick sand in the face of everyone who showed me. I must be the church that I witnessed. And I know that we can do it because I've already seen it. And man, the people we will reach, whatever I do for God in the future is always going to be linked back to Christians. Because I probably would have walked away from all of this had it not been for the church. <clears throat> That's one last thing. No. After a long season of the church just pouring love on me, I ran into a few just not Christians in the church. One guy, two weeks after my son passed, he said, bro, it's time to get over it. It's time to move on. And my son died a horrific death, okay? And he was just so insensitive. And I could not pay attention to the thousands over him. And I asked God, I said, God, I said, I thought you were going to show me the beauty of your bride. And this is God's word to me in prayer. He said, yes, you've seen my bride. She is a beautiful, stunning bride. But she's a horrible mother. We're more concerned about our wedding dress than we are having babies. And my wife has taught me more about the church. When she looked at me and she just beautiful, my wife is stunning. But she was never more beautiful to me when she looked at me. She goes, this body is not mine. It is to be given for children. And she's not trying to win a beauty pageant. Her body was designed to, to take care of our kids. That's the church. And I think we're just a little too pretty. Wow. That's, what, that's what I feel like. Wow. I almost dropped the mic about 10 times there. <laughs> brother, so the brother Rob in the back. He, um, this was very helpful. And I, I want to just mention this right now. Um, if you're picking up what Brother Holloway is saying, you have to become this. And the problem with religiosity is you can wear it and not be it. And that is what the devil wants. What did Eve put on, Adam and Eve? Big leaves. They grabbed the last thing God called good. The trees are good. Well, let's put that on so he'll think we're good. He liked us wow. naked and not ashamed. That's the way he designed us. Fully exposed to him. I have nothing to hide. That's how he designed us. So what we try to do, and this is, and we, we do this, we cover ourselves up with a version that is good and thinking he likes that. That's what we do. And there's nothing wrong. People misunderstand me often. Like, oh, so you're saying not to have standards? Let me explain briefly the meaning behind standards. Yeah. Okay. Where we have made a great error with standards, and this stays in the vein of righteousness and everything we're talking about, imaging, that's why I'm saying this. And I think it's relevant because people, we have uh, overcorrection problems. We hear someone say this, and we yank the wheel to the other side. We need to be centered. So standards, what we've done with them is we'll brag about what we've done. I've never looked at a woman. I've never drank alcohol. And we brag about it. That's, that's not the reason for standards. A standard is in place for two reasons, biblically. Your weakness and someone else's. That's the two reasons for a standard. I don't have social media, not because I'm spiritual. I'm too weak to have it. That's why I don't have social media. You can have social media. That's 100%. You knock yourself out. I can't have it. That's why I won't preach to you to get rid of it. You need to go ask the Father that. But where we are horrible is at having standards for someone else. Because we say, that's your problem. Righteousness makes other people's problems their problem. That's good. Wow. 
That's what true righteousness does. You got yourself in that condition. Get yourself out. What if God would have looked at us and said, sin is your problem? What if there's an old lady crossing the street and she's going real slow and a car's coming? You look at her and be like, shouldn't be old. That's your problem. <laughs> right? You're hanging on by the edge of a cliff and you don't have the strength to pull yourself up. Somebody walked by and be like, that's your problem. You shouldn't have slipped. Wow. So... Look at Jesus' words. You have heard not to commit adultery, but I have said, don't even look. And where, our, where we're at right now is a man could be like, well, she, she wore half nothing on Instagram. That's her problem. Make it yours. And here's why. Because she's made in the image of God. And if you look at her like she's some toy or an object to fulfill your little lustful desires, you have stripped her of dignity and you're no longer righteous. Flip that young lady could say, that's his problem. Make it yours. Wow. Be modest. Now let me draw the, the balance there. A young man who has a spirit of lust will lust after you if you're wearing a burqa. But at least that's, that's on him. But you still were contributing to make it your problem. <laughs> Holiness standards are not a uniform to look apostolic. They are embedded within the heart of a true disciple of concern for neighbor. That's the reason for standards. This is why it's, it's pure ignorance to brag about our standards. I don't drink because I'm apostolic. No, you don't drink because you don't want to get drunk and kill somebody. Right. It's not about you. <laughs> That's where we need to develop. When we become the image of God, it changes. I want you to go through your life and look at all your standards and find out how many make you look good and how many of them make someone else look good. And you might come to the same frustrating conclusion I did. I'm a Pharisee. That's the conclusion I came to. I'm doing this so that you'll think I'm holding fast, but I don't believe, I'm not doing any of it for the right motives. When Jesus said, um, hypocrites to the Pharisees. The word hypocrite is hypocrites in, in Greek. It means an actor. What we do is like, oh man, you're doing this and you're not that. You're a hypocrite. No, hypocrites means you're doing all the right things but for the wrong reasons. That's what hypocrites means. He looked at the Pharisees and said, oh, that's good. That's all good. You're just not doing it for the right reason. Clean first the inside of the cup. Same, same scriptures, context. He said, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, clean the outside or the inside of the cup first, then the outside. So what's inside the cup? When God poured his spirit in you, he poured all the fruit. It just hasn't fully matured and grown yet, but it was a seed. And as you nurture it as little micro gardens, as new Adams and Eves, we nurture the spirit until it grows into love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. When that starts to flourish, that's what's inside the cup. So now what I'm doing is I create standards to keep what's inside me pure. I don't want to hate anybody. Social media has helped me hate. So I've gotten rid of social media so that I could be better at love. I don't want that getting inside this cup. That's good. Love is in the cup, and I don't want anything taking it away. Joy is in this cup. So anything that strips me of joy, I get rid of it. Anything that's taking away from me my peace that's in this cup? No, clean the outside. I don't want that in my life. I love peace. Anything that is wrecking my patience, it needs to be gone. Clean the inside first. Develop the fruit. And here's what you're going to find out real quick. This is a lot of work. And once you do that much work, you don't want the stuff on the outside because you're like, man, I've been working for five years to love people. I don't need that in my life, making it easier for me to hate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's really easy to get rid of it. You will develop a standard, but do it for the right reasons. I'm sorry, take so much time on that. No, I just, I don't want this to stop. What time is it? One seventeen. I know you guys are hungry. You want me to keep, well, I mean, okay. Yeah, okay, well, they're hungry. So, for the word, not just the chicken, uh, chicken wings. You'll get your chicken wings, don't worry. Um, I really feel to uh, tag off of this, to hit on, you know, 
I want Brother AJ to, to talk about this, but we, sometimes we hear, you know, about being the image, being, you know, God is, he's all powerful, he's all knowing. But I, what I think we need to hit real quick is you can't become what you don't see. Yeah. You have to see yourself through his eyes. The problem is we hear the preaching and we hear all these things and it, it's very easy to believe it for Brother Holloway. It's very easy to believe it for Sister Alira. She's going to be, yeah, God's going to use you powerfully, but what about you? Yeah. And a lot of us struggle so much with this word, condemnation, yeah. accusation. This is probably one of the chief issues of, I think it's shame and condemnation, which work hand in hand. Shame is the emotion of sin. Shame is, you know, what the, the effect of sin. But condemnation is the voice of accusation that puts that you on the on the chopping block because of your sin and it's that voice of accusation that says you'll never become anything you'll never and here's the problem god can have all these grand plans but if you don't see it you'll never become it yeah. and so what i'd like for brother holloway to talk about for a few minutes is as we are becoming the image of god you need to see that image through his eyes not your own through his eyes you need to see the innocence you need to see who he wants you to become because if you don't see it, you're not going to become it. You mind talking about that for a minute? Yes, it is God's great pleasure, and I want to help you with the will of God. It says, for those to whom he foreknew, then did he predestine to be conformed into the image of his son. That's the will of God right there for you. He wants you to be like him. That's the will of God. Now, where we need to battle and we need to be armed with the word of God is... In the areas of condemnation, because that's what I've, I have found is destroying your generation. And I think the acceleration, the spirit's been around a long time, but I think it got accelerated with social media and things like that because you compare. And we see things and we don't know the whole backstory. You know, I've had some people look at me and they're like, oh man, God's using you. And I'm like, Shit, you, haven't, you haven't been with me the past 20 years. You know, the past 20 years have been rough. <laughs> so yes, here now, but in the grand scheme of things. But let's go back to the garden again and listen to God's words. All this happened over a question. So you need to be better at discerning. When we're, when we're looking for the devil, we're always like, our radars go off when we see evil. That's the devil. That's a smoke screen of the devil. The devil never comes cloaked in evil. He's smarter than that. Yes, he always comes cloaked in reasonable. You've been fasting for 40 days, Jesus. Turn a stone into bread. That's not evil. That's reasonable. <laughs> Has God said not to eat that fruit right there? That's not evil. When the adversary asks a question, his intention is always confusion. Now there's a second question in the garden. Where are you? That was God's question. It wasn't ignorance to geography. It was seeing if they would confess where they were. Because God knows everything. So they ask, he asked, where are you? Now, when God asks a question, he's looking for confession. When the devil asks a question, he's looking for confusion. So the next thing is they come out, and this is God looking for two failures, mind you. If God was cruel, he'd have just said, forget human humanity. I'm done with it. They heard the voice of God blowing in the cool of the day. The Hebrew renders out, they heard the language of God blowing in the wind as a spirit, is the actual Hebrew. And that spirit was looking for two young people that blew it. Now, give yourself some credit. They blew it with only one scripture in their Bible. <laughs> they had one verse. So they came and, you know, they did their whole thing. The serpent beguiled me, the man, the woman, you know, the whole blame game. And um, they said we were, we were naked and we were ashamed. So we clothed ourselves with goodness, so on and so forth. And this is what God said. He said this. And this is what I want you to remember. The whole reason I'm telling you the scripture is God's words were, who told you that? I want you to remember those words because that's always his question. God, I don't think I can do this. Who told you that? God, I'm just, I'm not like Brother McGurk. I don't, I don't have a resume of reaching my campus. Who told you I was comparing you to him? But, but I don't know the Bible like brother so-and-so who told you 
that I was comparing you to them. God, I'm not smart enough. Who told you that? But God, I messed up and you can't use me. Who told you that? That's God's favorite question. Now watch what he does when he asks a question to somebody who finally gets it right. The name Jacob, it means deceiver in Hebrew. It's, it's Yaakov. And God wrestles with Jacob and he says, what's your name? God knew his name. And he said in Hebrew, Aki Yaakov, I'm a deceiver. And the moment he heard true confession, he said, not in heaven, you're Israel. Confession is naked and not ashamed. We've got Instagram altars nowadays. It's all this pretty little altars. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. That's not, that's not confession. Yeah. Confession is coming into a prayer room and saying the thing that embarrasses you aloud. God, I am addicted to pornography. God, I am so insecure that I constantly turn the conversation into directions that I want to talk about so that I can feel self-worth. That's true confession. That's coming naked and not ashamed. When you take off the leaves of self-perceived goodness and come before him, he turns you into the name you are supposed to be. He says, ah, I'm glad you see it. We can work with that. So when you start stepping into that, you do what you were designed to do. And here's going to be a, a powerful revelation. You ready? You're not A.J. Holloway. I had a guy come up and be like, I want to preach like A.J. Holloway. I looked at him and I said, bro, I'm telling you right now, you'll never be able to preach like me. And I could see his face just drop. And I was like, you're not me. The greatest revelation I ever got, I was talking with Chris Green. And I just started evangelizing and I was like, bro, I said, I'm so stressed out. I said, I'm not you. I don't go to churches and 27 people get the Holy Ghost. I'm lucky when I leave, 27 people didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> my thing is when I go somewhere, I want people to fall in love with the word of God. That's my thing. And I'm going to do that real well. Timothy's not Paul. Yeah. And Paul isn't Timothy. Yeah. We need you to be the specific gifted person God designed you. And when you start comparing, God's always going to ask you, who told you that? That's so good. I, I asked you for confession. You're, if you're confused, that's not God's question. If you're feeling comfortable to confess, that's God's question. And when you confess, he transforms you into the likeness of his son. And so how do you view yourselves? I could have probably said this and avoided all of that. You are a child of God. Yeah. And I hate saying it because it sounds so cliche because we have bumper stickers of it. But has that dawned on you lately? That you are heirs and joint heirs with him? That he adopted you? And he looked at you and he said, you're mine. Yeah. I, I don't know how many, I know none of you younger are parents. Do you have kids? Do you have kids? Anybody in the room have kids? My my. Children, when they started learning to walk, they started walking. And the last thing in the world I was going to do was create obstacles for them and sit there as this wicked man and be like, I watch my kid just bust his face. This is going to be awesome. When they started taking their first steps, I cleared the room because I couldn't wait to embrace them when they walked to me. My daughter, God was dealing with me about sonship. I'd never prayed to God as the father because I'm oneness. And God started dealing with me about him being the father. He is the father. You can, you're not erasing that from scripture. He can be the father. So let me help with that so you don't get confused and go post it on social media and I get canceled. Um, <laughs> the father had to come down here and show us what sonship looked like because nobody in the Bible had shown us yet. So the father came down and showed us himself. And he said, look at me. Nobody's shown you this yet. So I had to come down and show you myself. That's why he is both the father and the son. And we have Hebrew to back that up. But... You get my point. But God was dealing with me about sonship and where I was finally, the, the nail that kind of like shut the coffin for me. My daughter woke me up at four in the morning and I travel full time. So I don't know why she woke me up because my wife is the one who's home most often. I believe it was God setting me up. She woke me up and she said at 4 a.m. But no parent wants to hear at 4 a.m. She said, Daddy, Daddy. I woke up. She looked at me. She said, I threw up. <laughs> And so in the Holloway home, I don't do the throw up. That's just kind of like our deal. I mean, I'll do anything else. I'll take out the trash. I'll mow the grass, throw up because it's a chain reaction. I smell throw up. 
I have a prophetic nose. I can smell you're about to fart before it happens. Like, <laughs> like that's how strong my sense, my sense of smell is. I'm like, you're about to fart right now. I can already smell it. 